Liam and Frank have both talked today about the exhibition's connections to industry and manufacturing. Uh, but I'm going to focus instead on their influence on consumption. And in essence, I'm going to argue that very unintentionally, the exhibition was a far greater stimulant to consumption than it was to production. And I'm going to talk about some of the ways that that played out during the exhibition itself and in the, the surrounding streets of, of the city. Um, by making uh, this argument, I'm following on from one of the earliest pieces of um, kind of modern scholarship, I suppose you could say, uh, on the Dublin exhibition, certainly that I know of, by Alan C. Davis back in 1981. And Davis pointed to the 1853 uh, organizers' hope that by emulating London's great exhibition, Ireland might also emulate British industrialization, so very much the, the kind of thing that uh, Frank was just discussing. Um, but Davis argued that, and I quote, such a simple notion confused cause with effect. Country after country acted as host to international exhibitions, partly in the hope that an exhibition would prove the magic first step on the ladder of industrialization. Ireland was early in the race. Davis also suggests that the exhibition may even have been counterproductive in its stated aims in that it, and again quote, probably hastened the decline of some rural industries by exposing their vulnerability to competition from imports. So my own research uh, from a book that I published, I realized when I was asked to do this talk, it's 13 years ago, which is appalling, um, which was on the development of consumer culture and department stores in Dublin. And this is how I kind of came to intersect with um, industrial exhibition research. And my own research on the, um, the, the, the sort of coincidence in timing between the rise of consumer culture in Ireland as elsewhere and the, um, the rise of great exhibitions in Ireland as elsewhere suggested I would go um, in, in many ways even further than Davis did and argue that there was a, a symbiotic relationship between the uh, developing department stores in the streets of Dublin and the exhibition as it was taking place um, in, you know, in, in the centre of, uh, of the city. And department stores were becoming a defining feature of the city at this uh, point. And I just want to focus for a moment on the, um, the precise timelines of that, just to underline how um, exact those, um, those overlapping dates um, were. So as many of you may know, De department stores themselves were a, a new phenomenon in the 1850s. Uh, that was really the first full decade in which department stores, as we would recognize them and as they understood themselves as new retailing formations, were coming into existence. Um, they generally developed from existing shops, usually haberdasheries, though not always. Um, and they, so, so starting from a relatively small haberdasher shop, they would then add more and more departments selling other products like hats, uh, lace, in fact, as we, was already been talked about today, ribbons, furniture, or ceramics. As they grew larger, they developed what would become the conventions of modern consumer culture, such as the display of go goods, clearly marked prices, and increasingly spectacular architecture and design intended to lure in middle-class female customers with luxurious spaces in which they could see and be seen as well as buy goods, so creating a new kind of middle-class female uh, semi-public space. In Dublin, by the time the exhibition opened in May 1853, there were at least seven department stores operating in the city. Um, the, there always does come up this question of how exactly you define when a, a shop got big enough to be a department store. And I have an example later on of one that's a kind of borderline case. But there were, there were at least seven that were really quite large by the time the exhibition opened in 1853. Some of them you will recognize uh, from today. These included, for example, Brown Thomas, which opened in 1849, and over the road from it, Switzer, Beatty & Co., both on Grafton Street, of course. Their near neighbors, Pym Brothers & Co., had been on South Great Georgia Street since 1843, so that's one that is now completely gone, uh, but some of you may remember its, its building. Moving down towards the river, there was McBurney Collis & Co. on Aston Quay, which is now, I think, a big spa. Um, for some of us, we, we think of it as the Virgin Megastore, but that was another era. But it still says McBurney Collis on the lintel over the door. And over on the north side, oh, 
me to do that. Uh, over on the north side, Cannock White & Co., which opened on Henry Street in 1843 and would, of course, become Arnott's when Sir John Arnott bought it later in the century. On Mary Street, Todd Burns & Co., which, again, now is the big pennies, um, had originally opened as an individual shop in 1841 and spent the next decade moving and expanding until they occupied an entire block running along Jervis Street. And that's how the individual haberdasher shops typically did develop over, you know, anything up to 10 years to achieve a kind of um, breakthrough size, I suppose, was by the building next door and then expand around corners because that was the easiest way to, to create one big individual space. So if you think of the building, which is now Marks and Spencer's and was Brown Thomas, it goes around the corner onto Duke Street and um, Todd Burns did something similar uh, off, off Mary Street. The most significant of them, particularly for us, however, was McSweeney and Delaney's New Mart, which opened... Uh, on Sackville Street um, in June 1853. And again, some of you might be familiar with this painting by Michelangelo Hayes, which um, really sort of foregrounds the, uh, the department store. So McSweeney, Delaney's and Co., which would become Cleary's, of course, in, in time, um, had a credible claim to be the first purpose-built department store in the world. You can see from the, na the, the nature of that building that it, it hasn't started out as an individual shop and then expanded around corners. Um, it, it's a, a fully um, deliberately designed department store. That is complicated by the fact that the upper stories were the Imperial Hotel for a long time. That wasn't all shop, but most of it was shop. And it's opening uh, in June 1853 was clear, an event clearly coincide, uh, clearly timed to coincide with the exhibition, which had only opened just a few weeks earlier. And you can see in uh, McSweeney and Delaney's opening publicity, there are adverts placed in the press which directly address visitors to the exhibition may also care to come and visit our new uh, shop, and so on. So there were a number of um, distinctive features uh, of the Dublin exhibition by comparison to the London one which it was um, emulating, which are interesting to us from the point of view of noting this relationship between exhibitionary culture and consumer culture. So the first of these was the use of price labels. Um, price labels on displayed goods were specifically proscribed in London, but Dublin allowed prices to be displayed and allowed um, purchases to be agreed with the exhibitors. You couldn't take the goods away while the exhibition was on, but you could uh, agree the purchase. But more important than that was that exhibitors were allowed to very clearly show price labels. Openly uh, displayed goods with price labels were one of the key differences between the new department stores and their smaller predecessors, in which customers typically had to ask for goods to be brought to them and ask for the price. The simple change of displayed prices radically expanded the demographic of leisure shoppers to include middle-class women who had disposable income but had to shop within a very specific budget and could use price labels to do so without the embarrassment of having to publicly admit in front of a, a shop assistant that the goods that were being shown to them were outside of their budget. And again, I can see people nodding. This is a feature of consumer culture which has remained really crucial. We all still recognize that sensation of uh, shops that don't display prices. You know that you probably shouldn't be in it. It was a, a tiny change, but it really changed the experience uh, of shopping. Uh, one of the other uh, differences between the uh, Dublin exhibition and uh, the London one was the layout, which in many cases, not universally, but in many cases, um, was often by exhibitor rather than category of good. Uh, it seems to have been a little more complicated than that. Uh, there, there clearly were some exhibits that were by category of good, uh, but many weren't. Theoretically, the exhibition was laid out to display categories of raw materials and industrial products, as the London exhibition had been. 
However, in practice, much of the Dublin exhibition was displayed according to contributor. Um, the Expositor newspaper, which I, I, I know has been mentioned and I'll have some more of in a moment, complained at the time that this meant, quote, it is therefore really difficult to judge of a class as a whole under such circumstances. And of course, laying goods out according to contributor is also a feature of the way that department stores laid out categories of goods, such as Limerick Lace, perhaps, for, for example. And then the um, final category of difference between Dublin and London uh, goes very much actually to the kind of thing that Liam was, was speaking about, um, is attendance, who went to the exhibition. Um, this was something which in the immediate aftermath, uh, when they were totting up the accounts without the benefit of the charts and spreadsheets that, that we have now, um, was something which even its organizers found puzzling uh, at the time. And this was, rather than the cash on the door customers that you were focusing on, Liam, it's the season ticket holders that they were puzzled by who they were. And that was because of the preponderance of female visitors to the exhibition. Among the middle and upper middle classes uh, who purchased the season tickets, the John Sproul's retrospective um, catalogue or account uh, of the uh, exhibition, commented that in London at the 1851 exhibition, it will be seen that among the holders of these tickets, the season tickets, the gentlemen had a considerable majority. But here, the ladies had nearly two to one. This is certainly a singular circumstance. And it is indeed a striking statistic, given that women can hardly have been the primary intended audience for an event designed to stimulate manufacturing activity and investment. So I'm going to suggest that these three um, small but crucial differences between Dublin and London are, are sort of ways of, um, can, can be understood as ways of um, playing out the symbiotic relationship between the exhibition and the, um, the shops. So obviously, um, all of these features point towards the exhibition resembling in certain respects a department store. Um, and this is perhaps not surprising. So to return to the expositor for a moment, which was, as I think others have mentioned, the exhibition's in-house weekly newspaper, they published many advertisers, advertisements, as you would expect. And the Dublin department stores were some of their main advertisers. It's noticeable, I'm gonna run through uh, a few in a moment, the, it's noticeable that these advertisements were extremely lavish by the standards of the 1850s when illustrations were unusual uh, and expensive, even um, sort of lithographic black and white illustrations like this. And most advertisements in 1850s newspapers were simply very simple text insertions, maybe a little extra white space around them, but not always even that. And you'll notice how different um, these are. All of the department stores that advertised in the expositor included uh, images, presumably in order to emphasize their own scale, um, albeit very much dwarfed by the exhibition itself. So we have the advertisement here for uh, Switzers with their own, at that point, still fairly modest premises on Grafton Street. The advertisement for McBurney Collis & Co., which is more recognizable to us as, as being at least similar to the building that's still standing there now. The advertisement for Todd Burns & Co., that of course is a different building from the one that's there now, which is a late 19th century uh, replacement. And McSweeney Delaney & Co., very similar to the Michelangelo Hayes uh, painting. The, these are so much more lavish than the kind of advertisements that the uh, that shops will be placing in newspapers on a, a regular basis. It suggests at the very least that they saw the readers of the uh, expositor as being a really important market for them to um, capture and, and appeal to. And if the department stores were keen to advertise themselves to exhibition visitors, some of them were also themselves exhibitors at the exhibition, something they were keen to advertise to their normal potential customers. So both Switzer's and Todd Burns & Co. included an exhibition logo in their regular Freeman's Journal advert. So this kind of advert is much more typical of uh, newspaper adverts uh, of the time, but they've Normally, it would just be that text, but here they include this little logo of the exhibition in order to emphasize that as well as being um, a, a department store, they are also exhibitors at the exhibition.
And a trace of this is, is visible in contemporary illustrations uh, of the exhibition itself. So this is a detail of that uh, amazing lithograph that is in the center of the Sproul publication. Some of you might have seen it in um, hard copy um, of the, the, the main hall. And if you zoom in on the, uh, the top corner of it, and then if you look above that doorway, you can see at the edge, I knew this resolution wouldn't, you're going, you, you're going to have to take my word for it, but the sign above the door says uh, Todd Burns. Um, I've scoured the rest of the image. You can see names of other uh, exhibitors on the, uh, some of the stands, but I can't see the names of any other actual department stores. If anyone else has spotted them, I'd love to know. The combined effect of displays according to contributor, along with fixed prices displayed on labels, must have made significant sections of the exhibition bear a strong resemblance to the department stores in operation in the nearby streets. There were also architectural and design similarities between department stores and the exhibition. Along with the price labels visible at both, their internal spaces were similarly designed with a view to displaying goods and commodities to advantage on a large scale and encouraging visitors to wander around at their leisure to see and be seen by other visitors. This required well-lit and open indoor space, often surrounded by galleries and mezzanines. One of the things we have vanishingly few of from this era is uh, any sense of the inside of department stores. Um, but one, one that we do, an image that we do have, this is, this is the, the shop that I said is very much borderline as a department store. It's a large tailoring shop. It's significantly larger than most tailors were at this time. Um, it's pushing it to say it was a, a full department store. But this is, again, advertising in the expositor and choosing to give us, rather than the exterior of the shop, as all the other shops were doing, giving us a, a, a vision of its um, inside. Um, their, um, their advertising of that time suggests that they're either a new business or have recently expanded quite significantly. And we know from contemporary reports, not actually uh, images, unfortunately, that, that I've been able to find, but um, detailed um, printed descriptions of the new McSweeney Delaney building, um, a few doors down from um, Richard Allen, literally a few doors down, was five stories high and had six large ground floor display windows, which you can sort of see there, which themselves were using the new technology of plate glass, which was designed to both let in as much light as possible, um, but also to create a kind of stage set display platform for, um, for goods that people could see from the street. Inside, it contained a mezzanine along with uh, above the first floor which looked out onto the great central hall, all of which was lit by natural light from the roof lights above. This was, of course, very similar to the way the exhibition's architecture created interior spaces which were reminiscent of, of those which department stores aspired to. The, great, the exhibition was doing this on a much, much grander, grander scale, but very, much, very kind of similar principles. A large central hall, sweeping staircases to, back to that lithograph, sweeping staircases to upstairs galleries and attempts to create effective display spaces with good natural light. This use of uh, a large ground floor with mezzanines on the upper floor and then um, some kind of lighting through the roof is of course necessary at this point in order to actually bring natural light into spaces this large. It's why you can't have uh, a ceiling and, and, and a kind of proper uh, first and second floor, as we might think of it, because the, uh, the ground floor would be so dark if, uh, if they did that. This was, of course, um, oh, sorry. This rather dis rep resembled the departments of, uh, of department stores. Uh, if you look on the, on the ground floor, these are images from the Illustrated London News reporting on the exhibition give us the Woolens Court, the court really standing in for um, department, and the Chinese court, again showing people wandering around admiring categories of, uh, uh, of object. These absolutely could be illustrations of the inside of department stores. So to conclude, the shops themselves understood the, the shared exhibitionary culture between themselves and the exhibition. Display of goods with an emphasis on open spaces, light and free movement, a display of prices, 
and shops advertising to exhibition visitors and advertising their own participation in the exhibition to their regular customers. And one of the reasons they're doing that, of course, is because in many cases, one of the things that is clear is that those are the same people. Because this provides probably one of the main answers to the singular circumstance the exhibition organizers noted, that among season ticket holders, women outnumbered men by two to one. Middle-class women were the expanding customer base of department stores, again, a final illustration of lots of people mingling, um, whose role it was to be efficient and discriminating shoppers who could assess and choose goods in order to create their family homes in the newly built red brick Dublin suburbs. They were also the same women who could afford the one guinea season tickets to the exhibition. And the fact that so many of them did so indicates that they, if not the exhibition organizers, understood it to be a parallel form of consumer culture to that which they found in the department stores. Thank you very much.